Good evening viewers and aspirants. I have something to share with you. As you know, Shankara Ice Academy has launched an app and in this app you can find all the materials that is required for UPSC preparation in one place. You can find the current affairs materials such as magazines and you can also find our daily Hindi news analysis videos in this app. Along with this you can find the study materials that is required for prelims as well as mains preparation. And then we also provide you with daily quiz in this app so you can test your knowledge in this app. Along with that you can find toppers, testimonials and you will get regular notifications regarding the updates in the UPSC preparation. And along with all this currently the pre-booking for online courses is going on in the Chankar Ice Academy. So those who want to book for this you can use this app for booking courses. And then if you have any doubts regarding the admissions, you can find answers to those questions in the application itself. So I request the viewers to download this application. You can download it from the Google Play or you can also scan this QR code to download it. So that is all. Now let us get to the Hindi news analysis for today. And today we'll be covering the Hindu edition dated 5th of March 2022. And these are the articles I have taken today. Before going into the article discussion, I have a special session today, which is the previous year prelims questions discussion. Now, in this session, I will be discussing two important questions. So, do not miss it. After that, I have this news article where we will be discussing about important cattle races festivals in India. And then, we will be seeing about some of important nuclear power plants in Ukraine and also some of the nuclear power plants around the world. And then in this editorial discussion we will be seeing about the three capital issue of Andhra Pradesh and then here we will be seeing the Kavach indigenous system. We will see what it is and how it works. And then in this last discussion we will be talking about semiconductors and the raw materials that are required to manufacture a semiconductor. And then I have a quiz question also for today after the prelims practice questions discussion. So pay attention to the discussion today so that you can attend the quiz question easily. Now let us get to the first session of previous year questions discussion. So aspirants I have taken two previous year questions based on history and these questions were taken from prelims 2019. Now let us take the first question consider the following statements deification of the Buddha treading the path of bodhisattvas image worship and rituals which of the above is or are the feature or features of Mahayana Buddhism so to answer this question let us see few facts about Mahayana Buddhism see Mahayana literally means the great vehicle it was a new form of Buddhism that developed by the first century CE actually developed around the rule of most famous Krishna ruler King Kanishka now this Mahayana Buddhism had certain distinct features particularly it had many changes from earlier forms of Buddhism that is the Theravada Buddhism. So let us see these changes or uh, distinct features now. See before Mahayana Buddhism the presence of Buddha was shown in sculpture by using certain signs. For example Buddha's attainment of Bodhi that is uh, Buddha's attainment of enlightenment was shown by sculptures of the people tree. So there were no statues of Buddha but in Mahayana Buddhism statues of Buddha were made. Many of these were made in Mathura while others were made in Takshila. So this was the first distinct feature or first change in Mahayana Buddhism. Secondly the early Buddhist teachings had given great importance to the self effort in achieving Nibbana. What is Nibbana? Nibbana means the cessation of anger and hate and it literally refers to the extinguishing of ego and desire. So previously Nibbana was given great importance. So at that time Buddha was regarded as a human being who attained enlightenment and Nibbana through his own efforts. But gradually this idea faded and another idea emerged. This new idea was that Buddha is a supernatural being and a savior. So it was believed that he was the one who could ensure salvation. So this happened in Mahayana Buddhism and this one resulted in the third change. The third change was the belief in Bodhisattvas or Bodhisattvas. 
See, bodhisattvas were supposed to be the persons who attained enlightenment or bodhi. And normally, once they attain enlightenment, they could live in complete isolation and meditate in peace. But instead of doing this, in Mahayana Buddhism, bodhisattvas remained in the world to teach and help other people. So this means bodhisattvas or the bodhisattvas were perceived as deeply compassionate beings who accumulated merit through their efforts. But they did not use this merit to attain Nibbana and thereby abandon the world. Rather, they used this merit to help others. So these were the three important changes in the Mahayana Buddhism from the earlier forms of Buddhism. Now keeping these facts in mind, now let us look at the question. The first statement mentions deification of Buddha. See, deification means making someone or something into a god. That is, it is the act or process of granting the position of a god to someone. So, in this regard, this first statement of deification of Buddha is correct because we saw that before the first century CE, Buddha was regarded as a human being who attained enlightenment. But by first century CE, he was seen as a supernatural being and a savior. This means he was exalted to the position of God or in other words, Buddha was deified. So, first statement is correct. Now, the second statement mentions that treading the path of bodhisattvas. See, treading the path means do something in a particular way. So, this statement mentions that doing it in the way of bodhisattvas. And during the discussion, we saw that the belief in bodhisattvas emerged in Mahayana Buddhism. So, this statement is also correct. Now, the third statement mentions image worship and rituals. This statement is correct because as we saw the first change was statues of Buddha was made and along with this rituals were also followed. So in this question all these three are features of Mahayana Buddhism and that is why the correct answer to this question is option D 1, 2 and 3. So now let us take up the next question. This question is based on the inscriptions about Ashoka. So before seeing the question, let us see few facts about Ashoka. See, Ashoka was one of the greatest rulers known to history from the Mauryan Empire. And as you know, Mauryan Empire was founded by Chandragupta Maurya. Chandragupta Maurya was the grandfather of Ashoka. And who was the father of Ashoka? It was Bindusara. And the capital of the Mauryan Empire was Pataliputra. And there are also other important cities in their empire. This included uh, Takshila, Ujjain, etc. For example, Takshila was a gateway to the northwest, including the Central Asia. On the other hand, Ujjain was on the route from North India to South India. So, merchants, officials and craft persons lived in these cities. Now, one of the important facts about Ashoka is that he is the only king in the history of the world who gave up conquest after winning a war. This was after Ashoka fought a war to conquer Kalinga. As you know, Kalinga was the ancient name of coastal Odisha. Now, he gave up war due to the violence and bloodshed that is associated with war. Plus, you should also know that Ashoka's Dhamma or Dharma did not involve worship of God or performance of a sacrifice. But he was inspired by the teachings of Buddha. Also note that during the period of Ashoka, the art of stupas reached its climax. It is said that almost 84,000 stupas were built or erected during Ashoka's period. Now, another notable feature of Ashoka's rule was, based on his instructions, inscriptions were inscribed on pillars and rock surfaces. And in all these places which are marked in red, the inscriptions can be found. So, remember these names in these places, Mauryan inscriptions, especially Ashokan inscriptions are found. Now note that these inscriptions were the symbol of the state or they were inscribed to commemorate battle victories. And these inscriptions, especially the ones on the pillars, were used to propagate imperial sermons also. So this made Ashoka as the first ruler who tried to take his message to the people through inscriptions. And note that most of Ashoka's inscriptions were in Prakrit and they were written in Brahmi script. So note that Prakrit was the language and the script was Brahmi. So let us see certain inscriptions or edicts with respect to Mauryan Empire or Ashoka. The first important one is Sogaura copper plate. See this Sogaura copper plate was found in Gorakhpur district of Uttar Pradesh. 
Note that it is the earliest known copper plate and this is a Mauryan record that mentions famine relief efforts. And it is one of the very few pre-Ashoka Brahmi inscriptions. So this was before Ashoka's period. Now next comes the Ashokan Edicts which is also called as the Edicts of Ashoka. These are a collection of 33 inscriptions on the pillars of Ashoka. These inscriptions were also on boulders and cave walls and they were inscribed from 269 to 232 BC. These inscriptions were dispersed throughout the country. They represented many things. For example, they described in detail about Ashoka's view about Dharma and they also represented the first tangible evidence of Buddhism, etc. The next important one is Ruminde Pillar Edicts in Lumbini. So we also call it as Lumbini Edicts. And this one mentions Ashoka's visit to Lumbini. Next one is Kalsi inscription. See, Kalsi is a town between Chakrata and Dehradun on the banks of Yamuna River. And it is a site of Ashoka's inscriptions. This one is unique because it is the only place in North India where the great Mauryan emperor has inscribed the set of 14 rock edicts. And the language of these edicts is Prakrit and the script is Brahmi. Next important one is Kalinga edicts. This place contains a set of rock edicts of Ashoka and the language of the edicts is Magadhi Prakrita and the script is early Brahmi. Next important one is Kanganahalli inscriptions. See this Kanganahalli is located in Gulbarga district of Karnataka. This site contains a Mahastupa with various sculptural slabs. See the sculptural slab also contains a stone sculpture of Mauryan King Ashoka. And it also holds a single line label called as Ranyo Ashoka in Brahmi script of Satvahana period. And the next important one is Shabas Gadi and Mansera rock edicts. See these two places that is Shabas Gadi and Mansera are located in present Pakistan. And they also contain the edicts of King Ashoka and they were written in Karosti script. So these were some of the important inscriptions or edicts belonging to the Mauryan Empire or the King Ashoka. Now let us look at the question. In which of the following relief sculpture inscriptions is Ranyo Ashoka mentioned along with the stone portrait of Ashoka? Option A, Kanganahalli. Option B, Sanchi. Option C, Shabazgadi. Option D, Sogaura. And just now we saw that in Kanganahalli only, the sculptural slabs are found and one of the slabs contains a stone sculpture of Mauryan King Ashoka along with the label Ranyo Ashoka. So the correct answer to this question is option A, Kanganahalli. And note that among these, in Sanchi we have the famous Ashokan stupa, which is a Buddhist stupa. And it is also a UNESCO World Heritage Site. It is situated in Madhya Pradesh. So I hope with these two questions, you would have revised some of the important facts regarding history. In my next class, I will be taking two or three more questions. Now let us get to the news articles discussion session. So the first discussion for the day is going to be based on this news article. It talks about the cattle races. So according to the article, after the pandemic induced break, the cattle races have begun again in many states. Especially this news article talks about the cattle races in Kerala, such as Kalaput, Maramadi, etc. And often we also see many cattle race festivals in news. So taking this opportunity, let us briefly understand about few important cattle race festivals in India. First, let us begin with Maramadi. See, as you know, India is an agro-economy based nation. So it welcomes and celebrates the harvesting season as a gala. So in this regard, the post-harvesting festivals are celebrated with boundless enthusiasm all over the country. And on those lines, among the Indian states, Kerala makes headlines for its most famous post-harvesting festival, which is locally known as Maramadi. This Maramadi is basically a bull race. And according to the spectators, Maramadi is best known and a must-see for the relentless spirit of competition among 300 pairs of bulls. And this race is held in the freshly ploughed, vast stretched paddy fields. So note that here, the paddy field is used as a stadium and to cheer the participants, the villagers gather around this stadium, which is the paddy field. Now next comes Kalaputu. This Kalaputu is an exciting ox race. It is again an agrarian sport of Kerala. It is also called as cattle race generally. 
and it is an enthusiastic rural sport and in this race also a pair of oxen are raised at a time and they are raised through ploughed fields having water so you may think both maramadi and kalapotu seem to be same kinds of festivals yes almost they are same but maramadi is the one that is celebrated in the southern districts of kerala and kalapotu is the one celebrated in northern districts of kerala now next comes moichara this is celebrated in different parts of rural bengal i know that this is also a cattle race and according to the sources this festival is celebrated to increase the fertility of agricultural land before the monsoon now next comes the kambala race see this kambala is a buffalo race and it is an event which is popular in coastal karnataka districts and this kambala race is performed on two parallel race tracks these race tracks are filled with slushy water and note that the buffalo owners and farmers in the region take great care of their buffaloes for their race and these buffaloes are well fed oiled and nurtured for the race and note that here the buffaloes are usually raised in pairs they are held together with ploughs and ropes and during the race two teams of buffaloes along with their jockeys race towards the finish line on two parallel race tracks and this event begins after the paddy harvest is done which is usually during the month of october and next comes the jallikattu see jallikattu is a festival of tamil nadu and it is a sport that is conducted as part of the pongal festival particularly it is part of the maattu pongal see this maattu pongal is the third day of the four day long harvest festival of pongal and here the term maattu means maadu which refers to bull so the third day of pongal is dedicated to cattle and this jallikattu term is derived from the words salli which means coins and kattu it means tie so jallikattu term refers to bundle of coins that is tied to the horns of the bulls so in older times what used to happen was the tamer who is sought to tame the bull have to remove this bundle of coins from the animal's horns and then they will win gold or silver and those who could do this would be called brave and valorous and that is why it is a famous sport and also note that this jallikattu is known as air thaluvudal or manjuvirattu and in this sport the fighters pounce on the running bull and try to hold on to its hump and they move along with the animal without falling or getting hurt and they try to get the prize money so these are some of the few cattle race festivals in our country i am not getting into whether these races should be banned or not just note the names of these festivals and the state to which they belong to and what kind of race it is we saw about maramadi kalaputtu moichara kambala and jallikat so with these points in mind now let us get to the next discussion so now this discussion is going to be based on this news article which talks about an important nuclear power plant see the news is that as part of russian attack on ukraine the russian forces have seized a nuclear power plant in ukraine here we are talking about the zaporizhia nuclear power plant so today we'll quickly go through the location of this power plant and we'll also see some of the other important nuclear power plants in the world so with respect to ukraine remember that it operates four nuclear power plants with 15 reactors these four nuclear power plants are Kamelnitsky nuclear power plant the Rivne nuclear power plant the South Ukraine nuclear power plant the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant so in this map you can see the location of these nuclear power plants so here you can see that the South Ukraine plant and the Zaporizhia plant are nearer to Crimea whereas the other two are in the northwest and note that the total installed nuclear power capacity is over 13 gigawatt electricals and the energo atom which is a ukrainian state enterprise it operates all these four active nuclear power plants in ukraine now if we specifically see about zaporizhia plant so you know that it is located in the southeast of ukraine it is located on the shore of kakhovka reservoir this is a wire receives water from the neper river and according to international atomic energy agency this nuclear power plant comprises of six units and each have a net capacity of 950 megawatts electricals or a total of 5.7 gigawatts electric 
The most important point to remember here is that this Zaporizhia nuclear power plant is the largest of Ukraine's four nuclear power plants and it produces approximately half of the country's electricity. This plant actually generates 40 to 42 billion kilowatt hour which accounts for one-fifth of the average annual electricity production in Ukraine. And it also accounts for almost 47% of the electricity generated by all the Ukrainian nuclear power plants. And not only that, this Zaporizhia nuclear power plant is the largest plant in the Europe itself. It was set up in the year 1984. So these are the facts you need to know about the nuclear power plants in Ukraine. Now let us see some other important nuclear power plants in the world. See, as you know, nuclear technology was first developed in the 1940s and during the Second World War, initially the research was focused on producing bombs. But only in 1950s, the attention turned to the peaceful use of nuclear fission and controlling it for power generation. So today, civil nuclear power is prominent and nuclear power plants are operational in 32 countries worldwide. In fact, many more countries rely on nuclear generated power to some extent through regional transmission grids also. This includes the countries like Italy and Denmark. And there are also countries that rely on imported nuclear power. For example, countries like US, Brazil, Switzerland get almost 10% of their electricity from imported nuclear power. So in this regard, you have to know the top 10 world's largest nuclear power plants by capacity. I'm going to read these names. Just go through it. The first one is Kashiwazaki Kariwa in Japan. Then Uljin in Gyeongsangbuk-do province of South Korea. Then Yongwang in South Korea. Then Zaporizhia plant in Enerodar of Ukraine. And then Gravelines plant in the Gravelines region of France. Then Paluel in Normandy of France, then Catanom in Catanom of France, and then Bruce in Canada, and then Oi in Fukui Prefecture of Japan, then Fukushima Daiichi in Okuma, Japan. And yes, you are right, in 2011, the disaster happened in this Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant only, and based on the capacity, it is in the 10th place. So these are the few points you have to remember with respect to nuclear power plants around the world. See, go through these names once or twice so that you'll have an idea of where they are located. And since the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant is often in use, remember that it is in southeast of Ukraine. So with these points in mind, now let us get to the next discussion. Our next discussion is going to be based on this news article. It has been written in the backdrop of a recent verdict of High Court regarding the capital of Andhra Pradesh, particularly Amravati as a capital. See, as you know, Amravati region was made the capital of Andhra Pradesh in the year 2014. But then, the current Chief Minister of Andhra Pradesh is demanding three capitals for Andhra Pradesh. So, in this matter, now the High Court has given its verdict. So, in this discussion, we will briefly see the three capital issue of Andhra Pradesh. We will see what are the issues in it and then we will see the High Court's verdict. The syllabus relevant to this discussion is given here for your reference. See, first let us see the demand for three capital in the state of Andhra Pradesh. See, the Chief Minister of AP is demanding Vishakapatnam and Karnul as capital apart from Amravati. These three cities are to function as capital for the state of Andhra Pradesh for the three pillars of its government. That is, Amravati is being demanded as the legislative capital and Vishakapatnam is being demanded as the executive capital and Karnul is being demanded as the seat of High Court. And this demand is based on the idea of decentralized development. And there are many reasons stated by the current Andhra Pradesh government for this demand. So let us see what are these reasons. See, the first reason given by them is that if they have three capitals, then each pillar of the government will function efficiently. Along with this, they also claim that the time and cost of travel will be significant. Now, the second reason given is that there will be suffering in other areas due to lack of funds. Why? Because all the available financial resources has to be utilized to develop one area, which is Amravati. So, they are claiming that if they have three capitals, the resources will be utilized in a better way. And the third reason given is a historical reason. See, this three capital demand is a historical recommendation. Actually, this recommendation is based on the Sri Bhag Pact of 1937. See, this Sri Bhag Pact was between the leaders of coastal Andhra and Rail Seema. 
and as per this pact they were to establish two university centers one will be at uh, voltaire in uh, visakhapatnam and the other will be at anandpur in raylseema and as per this pact it was also agreed to establish a high court in the coastal districts and metropolis at raylseema so based on this pact they are demanding the three capitals and another reason given is the bcg recommendation see bcg stands for boston consultancy group it is a global management consulting firm this firm in january 2020 has recommended that visakhapatnam should be the seat of the governor chief minister and all government departments along with this it also recommended that vijayawada and amravati should have the assembly and a high court bench and finally it also recommended that karnool should have the high court and the tribunals so these are some of the reasons behind the demand of three capitals for andhra pradesh now let us see what are the problems behind this three capital demand see for example if you take the first claim that the time and cost of travel will be significant we know that this is not true why because for example if visakhapatnam is made the executive capital then it will be 700 kilometers from the judicial capital karnool on the other hand the executive capital visakhapatnam will be 400 kilometers from legislative capital amravati and then the distance between amravati and karnool will be 370 kilometers so if the assembly is in session then all the officers of the government and the ministerial staff may be asked to attend it or some of them may be asked to attend it then in such a scenario the officers who will be at the executive capital will probably have to leave visakhapatnam and they have to stay in the legislative capital amravati so what will happen at such a time this means they will have to leave behind their other responsibilities in visakhapatnam and have to be in amravati so from this itself we can say that this will not make the executive efficient so this logic applies for all the three pillars of the government so in this manner the time will also not be saved and the costs will also increase so this is the first problem with the claim now second they also claim that if amravati is made the only capital then all the financial resources will be utilized for developing amravati only and if we take the same argument then that means now also only these three regions that is visakhapatnam karnool and amravati will be developed if they have three capitals so by this is the government meaning that they will not be developing any other part of andhra pradesh so this argument of if we have one capital then only that region will be developed is baseless now the third problem is associated with the funds that have been spent so far and the land that has been pooled for building the capital of amravati so as you know the then chief minister of andhra pradesh mr chandrababu naidu was focused on building a world class capital in amravati and for that he launched an innovative land pooling scheme and for this 33 acres of fertile land was taken from farmers belonging to 29 villages and as a compensation the land owners were promised of developed highly valuable plots in return and in addition to this they will also be given monetary compensation per acre per year this was the plan along with this an act was also launched for this purpose the act was called the andhra pradesh capital region development authority act of 2014 this act talks about building a new capital at amravati after telangana was carved out of andhra pradesh so this was the scenario but in 2019 everything changed after the change of the government in andhra pradesh because the current chief minister of andhra pradesh mr jagmohan reddy he enacted another act it is called the andhra pradesh decentralization and inclusive development of all regions act and this act was passed for establishing three capitals that is the executive capital visakhapatnam legislative capital amravati and judicial capital karnool plus they also passed a legislation to repeal the 2014 act which was passed by the then government so this was the scenario but now this plan of current chief minister of andhra pradesh is also being opposed mainly it is opposed by the farmers from the amravati region why we know that they were hoping for massive development and they were also hoping for huge returns on their land once the capital city is built but now this will be reduced and secondly the three capital plan is also opposed because of the practical logistic problems that will come into play while coordinating between the three capitals and thirdly it is opposed saying that the state government is misusing taxpayers money so this argument is made since significant infrastructure had already been built in amravati 
so developing two more capitals will further drain the public exchequer so these were the issues behind the three capital demand and the reasons behind its opposition now remember that the andhra pradesh decentralization and inclusive development of all regions act that was brought by the current chief minister of ap was actually repealed in november 2021 and in place of it a new legislation will be brought and the reason given for the repeal of this legislation was that they are saying that a complete comprehensive improved bill will be introduced again and in this bill all issues will be considered and it will also explain its intent to the people belonging to all regions of andhra pradesh so now what the high court has to say in this matter so when this three capital demand was made immediately the opposition filed a petition in the high court and now the judgment has been given by a three member bench of andhra pradesh high court now in this significant judgment the high court has asked the andhra pradesh government or directed the andhra pradesh government to adhere to the 2014 act which was the andhra pradesh capital region development authority act why because this act already provides for the declaration of new capital area for the state of andhra pradesh plus it also talks about the establishment of a capital region development authority and as per the act this authority will plan coordinate execute supervise finance fund and will also promote and secure the planned development of the capital region along with this it will also undertake the construction of new capital region development area and it will manage and supervise the urban services in the new capital area now since all these will be provided by the capital region development authority itself the high court has asked the government to adhere to the 2014 act along with this two important factors were also considered by the high court while delivering the verdict the first factor that was considered was that already the project to develop amravati as a capital was started so 33000 acres had been given up by farmers therefore if this act is repealed then the expenditure that was put in the development of the project will be lost additionally what will happen to the land that was acquired is not known and the second factor was that As part of the land pooling certain promises were made to the farmers so if this act is repealed then the promises will not be fulfilled and that is why high court of andhra pradesh has directed the andhra pradesh government to implement the master plan for amravati as per the capital region development authority act and it has also directed the government to fulfill its commitment that was given to the farmers within 6 months So this is the recent development in the three capital issue of Andhra Pradesh. I hope you got all the points. Let us just revise what we discussed. See the three capital demand is Amravati as legislative capital, Visakhapatnam as executive capital and Karnool as high court capital. This is based on the decentralized development idea. The reason stated behind this is functioning of each pillar of the government in an efficient manner. Second, to utilize the financial resources in a better way. third because it was uh, already promised under shri bag pact of 1937 and fourth because it was recommended by the boston consultancy group in 2020 now the problems behind the three capital demand is first the time and cost will not be reduced rather it will be increased and this will affect the efficiency of the executive and actually all the pillars of the government and second developing the state is the function of the government so stating that the financial resources will only be used to develop the capital area is baseless and third already 33000 acres of fertile land has been acquired and the development of amravati as a capital has begun so too much money and too much land has been put into it so if that plan is abandoned then all this money will be lost and the farmers will suffer and the next issue is that the farmers were promised certain things for example they were promised developed high valuable plots in return for their fertile land now if the single capital plan is abandoned then this promise will not see the light plus we also have the logistic problems in coordinating between the three capitals and based on all these reasons the high court of andhra pradesh has asked the government to proceed with the 2014 plan itself and it has asked the government to fulfill the commitments made to the farmers within 6 months so these were the important points that you have to remember from the discussion of this editorial article now let us get to the next discussion so this discussion is going to be based on the news article from the hyderabad edition this article talks about an indigenously developed system called as kavach this kavach is a train collision avoidance system see actually the news is that 
This system was commissioned yesterday for uh, 2000 kilometers in the South Central Railway Zone in the first phase of its implementation. And according to the news article, in the future, the system is planned for countrywide implementation by taking up 4000 to 5000 kilometers each year. So this is the crux of the news article. And from exam perspective, we need to know about coverage and some important functionalities of this system. See, to understand about coverage, first we need to know what is a train collision avoidance system. See, as the name suggests, it helps in avoiding train collision. And this TCAS or train collision avoidance system is an indigenously developed automatic train protection system. So what is this automatic train protection system? See, actually, each train has two important aspects. First is an authorized speed that is allowed by signaling. And second, automatic stopping at particular signal aspects. These are the two important aspects in a ATP system. Now, what this ATP does is, it frequently checks whether the speed of a train is compatible with the permitted speed or not. And along with this, it also checks whether there is automatic stopping of train at certain signal aspects. So, for example, if the train is not in the permitted limit or if the train is not automatically stopping at certain signal aspects, then in such a scenario, ATP activates. That is the automatic train protection system activates. It activates an emergency brake to stop the train. So, we can say that this ATP provides a fail safe protection. See, when we say something is fail safe, we mean that it has been designed in such a way that if one part of it does not work, then the whole thing does not become dangerous. So, this ATP is a fail safe protection against overspeed, collision and other hazardous conditions that happens through train detection, train separation and interlocking. Now, apart from this, there is also another feature called as a signal pass jet danger, SPAD. See, this is an event during which a train passes a signal at danger without any authority. Here, signal at danger means the signal is to stop, but the train did not stop. So, when a train passes a stop signal, even when it is not allowed to do so, we call it as SPAD, that is signal passed at danger. So, from the name itself, you could understand that this is a frightening event for any railway system and it could have many disastrous outcomes. But with the implementation of coverage, there is protection against SPAD also. Another important feature of a TCAS is that it provides continuous update of movement authority. See, movement authority in railways refers to the distance up to which the train is permitted to travel without danger. That is, the permission for a train to move to a specific location with supervision of speed is what is called as movement authority. So, if there is an unsafe situation and there is a necessity to apply brake, but if the crew has either failed to apply the brake or if the crew is not in a position to apply the brake, then in a TCA system, the automatic brake application takes place. So, we can say that in a TCAS, the system takes control over the brake system whenever necessary, like in an unsafe condition. Here, the unsafe condition could be like a car or an animal is uh, passing over the railway tracks. And at that time, if the railway crew does not apply brake, then the system will automatically apply the brakes. Plus, you should also note that the TCAS has additional features to display information like speed, location, then the distance to the signal ahead and other signal aspects, etc. And this is displayed in the loco pilot's cab. Who is a loco pilot? Loco pilot is the engine driver or any other competent railway servant for the time being who is in charge of driving a train. So, the loco pilot's cab is the place from where the engine driver actually controls the operation of train. Plus, there is also another important feature of TCAS, which is it facilitates the generation of auto and manual SOS messages. See, SOS messages means the distress messages. That is, it will send a message saying that the train is in distress or a collision is going to happen and we need assistance. So, this distress message is generated from the loco pilot's cab as well as from the station unit in case of an emergency situation. So, these are the few features that you need to know about coverage, which is a train collision avoidance system. Now, as I said in the beginning, the system is indigenously developed. That is, it is indigenously developed by Research Design and Standards Organization, RDSO. 
This RDSO is an organization under the Ministry of Railways and it functions as a technical advisor and consultant to the railway board in aspects of design and standardization of railway equipment. It also provides advice and consultancy in the problems related to railway construction operations and maintenance. So that is all about Kavach. What we saw, we saw that Kavach is a train collision avoidance system. And what is a train collision avoidance system? It is an automatic train protection system. And in an automatic train protection system, the speed of the train is checked frequently. And along with that, whether the train is stopping at certain signal aspects or not is also checked. And if the train doesn't satisfy these criteria, then the ATP activates the emergency brake to stop the train. So this provides protection against overspeed, collision and other hazardous conditions. Particularly, it also protects us against the signal passed at danger and also provides a continuous update of movement authority. And then we also saw that it has additional features to display information like speed, location, distance to signal ahead, etc. And it also sends automatic as well as manual SOS messages. And this system is indigenously developed by Research Design and Standards Organization under the Ministry of Railways. So these are the few points that you have to remember regarding coverage. Actually, coverage means an armor or a shield. What an armor or a shield does? It protects us from dangers. So in a similar way, this coverage system protects the train from collisions. So with these points in mind, now let us get to the next discussion. So our last discussion for the day is going to be based on this news article. This news article reports about Moody's Analytics. As per this analytics, there might be severe impact on global supply chains due to the ongoing Russia-Ukraine war. Especially, this will affect the chip manufacturing sector. That is, the semiconductors manufacturing will be affected. This is because the warring nations, that is Russia and Ukraine, control significant supplies of key raw materials that are used in semiconductors. And that is why their supply may be affected. So this is the crux of the news article. Now, in this backdrop, let us see about semiconductors in brief, especially some important raw materials that are used for making semiconductors. See, semiconductors possess specific electrical properties. So basically, when a substance which conducts electricity, it is called conductor and a substance that does not conduct electricity is called an insulator. And the semiconductors are substances with properties somewhere between them. Or in other words, we can say that a solid substance that has a conductivity between that of an insulator and that of most metals, either due to the addition of an impurity or because of temperature effects, will be called as semiconductors. And the most commonly used semiconductors are gallium, arsenide, germanium and silicon. Here you should note that silicon is used in electronic circuit fabrication and gallium arsenide is used in solar cells, laser diodes, etc. Apart from this, integrated circuits and electronic discrete components such as diodes and transistors are made of semiconductors only. Here you must note one thing which is that semiconductors are created by adding impurities to the element. And the conductance or inductance of the element depends on the type and intensity of the added impurities. Just remember that the deliberate addition of a desirable impurity is called as doping and the impurity atoms which are being added are called as dopants. Now coming to the most commonly used elements uh, in semiconductors, this includes uh, silicon germanium as I already said and as you know silicon is the second most abundant element on earth. It makes up almost over 25% of the earth's crust by weight. And next if you take germanium, it is a chemical element that is similar in appearance to the silicon and it is not found as a free element in nature because of its reactivity factor. But if you look at the news article, it talks about palladium and neon also. See this palladium belongs to the platinum group metals, PGMs. This platinum group metals comprise of six closely related metals. This six closely related metals are platinum, palladium, rhodium, ruthenium, iridium and osmium. Now this palladium metal or the silver palladium powder paste, they are important products in production of many electronic components. In this regard, the pastes of palladium metal are used in active components such as diodes, transistors, integrated circuits and even in semiconductor memories. Also note that palladium can sometimes replace gold which are used in the coatings for lead frames of semiconductors. Now next comes neon. 
Neon is the fifth most abundant element in the universe. And with respect to semiconductors, you should know that rare gases are widely used in semiconductor manufacturing because of the inertness and the extreme chemical stability of these rare gases. So in this regard, neon is critical for the lasers which are used to make the semiconductor chips. So in this manner, you should note two facts. First is that chip makers account for more than 90% of the global neon consumption. And second, Ukraine is home to half of the world's neon gas. And that is why war in Ukraine will affect the supply of neon and thereby affecting the manufacture of semiconductor chips. So these are the few points that you have to remember regarding semiconductors and few raw materials used in the manufacture of semiconductor chips. With these points in mind, now let's move on to the next session which is the practice questions discussion session. So now let us take up this first question. It is a three statement question. The first statement is there are 22 operational nuclear reactors in seven nuclear power plants across India. See this statement is actually correct. There are 22 operational nuclear reactors in India and they are in 7 nuclear power plants. They are Tarapur Atomic Power Plant, Rajasthan Atomic Power Plant, Madras Atomic Power Plant, Narora Atomic Power Plant, Kakrapar Atomic Power Plant, Kaiga Generating Station and Kudangulam Nuclear Power Station. So first statement is correct. Now the second statement. Uranium reserves in India are extremely limited. This statement is correct. This is the reason why India has to import large quantities of uranium from countries like Russia, Namibia, Argentina, Kazakhstan and Mongolia. But if you take thorium, India has large reserves of thorium. Now if you look at the third statement, in comparison India has large reserves of thorium. This statement is actually correct. So that means all the three statements in this question are correct. Therefore the correct answer to this question is option C, all the above. Now this next question is based on train collision avoidance system. It is a two statement question. First statement is, it is indigenously developed by research design and standards organization. This statement is correct. See remember that this train collision avoidance system was rechristened as Kavach. So as we saw in the discussion, Kavach was uh, developed by RDSO and this RDSO is under the Ministry of Railways. So this statement one is correct. Statement two. It detects dangers and sends SOS alerts but does not stop the train. Now you have to read the statement carefully. The first half if you take, it detects dangers and sends SOS alerts. So we saw during discussion that signal passed at danger which is PAD is detected and prevented by Kavach or TCAS and it also sends SOS alerts. SOS alerts are the distress alerts. It could be sent from the loco unit or the station unit. So first half is correct. Now the second half but does not stop the train. This half is incorrect because during discussion itself we saw that one of the crucial work done by DCAS is applying automatic brakes so that it could avoid uh, any mishaps like collision of trains. So second statement is incorrect and here the question asks for the correct statements. So the correct answer to this question is option A1 only. Now this next question is based on semiconductors. First statement is they have resistivity or conductivity intermediate to metals and insulators. Yes, we saw that semiconductors are materials which have electrical conductivity between conductors and insulators. So statement one is correct. Second statement, they are small in size, consume low power, operate at low voltages and have long life and high reliability. This statement is also correct. These are the important features of a semiconductor or we can say they are also the advantages of a semiconductor. So in this question both the statements are correct and the question also asks us to identify the correct statements. So the correct answer to this question is option C both 1 and 2. So with these three prelims practice question now let us take up this quiz question. Yes this question is based on the cattle race festivals discussion of today. So those who can answer this question now itself, you can post the answer in the comment section. And those who find it difficult to answer this question, you can go back to the discussion and then answer this question. Along with this, I have this mains question also. So interested aspirants can write answer to this question and post the answer in the comment section. Whenever we get time, we'll review that answer. So viewers, with this, we have come to the end of today's Hindi news analysis session. 
as usual if you like this video don't forget to like comment and share and also subscribe to shankar is academy youtube channel and download shankar is academy application from play store thank you Thank you.